tonight we are going back to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. So last week we started on part one of the teaching and tonight we want to go on to part two. Before I go any further, can people confirm to me that you can see the slides on the slide share? Yes. Okay, thank you. So last week we looked at Hebrews chapter 11, part one. And like I said, tonight we're wanting to do part two. We haven't got enough time tonight to go through what we did last week, but the recording is available on YouTube. So if you want to see what we did last week, please go and watch it on YouTube. But just as a form of recap, last week we talked about what is faith. And so when you go to Hebrews 11, chapter one, the Bible gives us a definition of faith there. And here we have the different versions of that Hebrews 11, chapter one. So the Jerusalem Bible says, only faith can guarantee the blessings that we hope for or prove the existence of the realities that at present remain unseen. So the only way you can be guaranteed to receive the blessings that the Bible talks about, the blessings that you hope for, both in this earthly life and in the life to come in eternity, the only way you can receive those blessings is through faith. And what the Jerusalem Bible is saying is that through faith, we prove the existence of the realities that we cannot always see by our physical eyes. Your faith is the proof that there is a reality in the realm of the spirit that you don't always see with your natural eyes. The King James Version says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when you talk about substance, you mean something that you can hold on to. Substance as opposed to something that is, that is not tangible. So substance is that something that you can hold on to. And the King James Version is saying, our faith is that tangible thing that we hold on to when we have hopes in the word of God. It says our faith is the evidence that we have of the things that you cannot see with your natural eyes. The New Living Translation says, what is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot yet see. So when you have faith, it's not a case of um, maybe uh, maybe it's going to work out. Uh, let's just wait and see. Let's see how it will work out. Uh, maybe God is going to answer or maybe he's not going to. Uh, maybe it's going to be. Maybe it's not going to be. That's not faith. Faith is a confident assurance that the thing that you hope for, you expect it to happen because your expectation and your confidence is based on the word of God that can never change. So you have a confident assurance because it's not just what you've dreamed up or what you're imagining, but it's what God said. It's what God has spoken in his word. And so it's a confident assurance. You are confident that everything God said is going to come to pass. The Bible says true faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of your circumstances or the consequences. So faith is not just about dreaming up things or what to do or, oh, um, I have faith that I'm going to go to the moon or I have faith that one day I'm going to visit planet Mars. That's not faith. Faith is, what did the Bible say? If the Bible says it, then I'm going to obey it. For example, we talked last week that if the Bible tells you, to forgive. If somebody hurts you, somebody annoys you, somebody makes you angry, somebody disappoints you, and the Bible says you've got to forgive them, you might not feel like forgiving them. Your circumstances might be very difficult and painful, but because the word of God told you to obey, you are going to forgive that person because that's what the word of God said. So faith is our obedience to God's word and it's not dependent on what your circumstances are or what the consequences of your actions are so for example there are some people who live in nations where Christianity is illegal where reading the Bible is illegal it's not allowed where practicing Christianity is not allowed but those people obey God confidently in spite of the circumstances of their nation and they don't bother with whether the government said they like Christianity or not. They go ahead 
and they obey God and they serve God and they continue with their faith regardless of their circumstances. So what we said last week is faith is not some feeling that you manufacture. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is your response to the revealed word of God. If your faith is not based on the word of God, then that has nothing to do with Christianity. If you're basing your beliefs on other things, then God is not expected to make it happen for you. But if you're basing it on what God said, then God will make it happen because it is his word and his word never lies. He never lies. He is faithful. Amen. So again, describing what faith is, we talked last week about how through faith, through faith, we are able to realize the spiritual reality of what the Bible promises us. Through faith, we're able to gain God's approval. We read last week that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. There's no way. The only way we can please God is when we have faith in him. And it is through faith that we receive the answers to our prayers. So like last week, we were talking about the woman in Luke 7 verse 50. How that Jesus spoke to that woman that her faith had saved her. Her faith had made her whole. She was sick. She needed healing. The Bible says she had an issue of blood that had been going on for so many years. But because she had told herself that if I hold on to the word of God, if I touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I will be healed. Jesus said to her, her faith had saved her and she was able to receive healing. So this is what faith can do for us. One Bible scholar called William Newell said, faith is not, oh, I hope, I hope. I just hope it's going to happen. I just hope I get it. But faith is saying to yourself, I have it. I already have it. It might not have materialized in the natural realm yet, but I have it. I believe that I have it. Faith is not bothered about whether your eyes can physically see something. It's not about consulting your brain or the physical aspects of you. It's not about your feelings. It's about saying God's word said this and I believe it. I have it. So the example of Noah that we looked at last week, that Noah, he built an ark even though he had never seen rain prior to the day that the flood came. Rain had never come on planet earth then. The earth was being watered by springs that would come from the ground. So Noah receives a word from God that says a flood is coming. He had no reference for what a flood is. He had never seen a flood. He had never seen rain. But because God said it, he started to build the ark. He built the ark. He didn't care that there wasn't any rain falling. He didn't care that people were probably laughing at him thinking he's gone, out, he's gone out of his mind. There's something going wrong with him. Why is he talking about flood? We've never seen rain. There's never been anything like that. Where is he getting it from? But year in and year out, he carried on. He didn't look at the sky to see whether the rain would start falling. So faith is a conviction of things, even when we cannot see them. You're absolutely convinced. When God told Noah there was going to be a flood, he built the ark. You know, somebody told the story once upon a time of a, a, a village where there had been no rain. They were experiencing drought. And so the local church called a prayer meeting for everybody to come and pray for the rain, for the rain to come. And everybody gathers by that local church to start the prayers for rain. And when they get there, a little child turns up and he's carrying an umbrella. He was the only person with an umbrella. And guess what? That was the only person with faith in that group. Because he came to pray for the rain. He brought an umbrella. He fully expected the rain to fall after his prayers. And that's how we ought to be. After you finish praying, after you finish holding on to the word of God, you're supposed to believe that what you have just said is certainly going to come to pass. Like we said already last week in Hebrews 11:6. When we don't exercise our faith, it is another way of saying that God is a liar. Because if you don't trust him and he has asked you to trust him, it means that you're telling him he's a liar. He's a liar. He doesn't deserve to be trusted because the basis for trust 
is that somebody is telling you the truth. If I telephone you right now today and I call you up and I say, um, Sister Janet, I'm going to come over to your house in about 10 minutes and I'm bringing you 500 pounds for you to pay your rent. If you think I'm a liar and your rent still needs getting paid, you will put that phone down, continue to be worried, continue to go on the bank website trying to apply for a loan. But if you think that I tell the truth, because I've said I'm coming with the money, you will immediately stop stressing about where is the rent going to come from. In the same way, the Bible is a collection of promises that God has given us. If we believe the word of God and we believe what God has said, then there is a way that we will stop worrying and we will believe that what has been written will come to pass. If you doubt the truth of God's word, you cannot trust him. And you cannot believe, you cannot have faith. But if you believe the word of God, then you will trust God. You will know that if God said it, then that is it. It doesn't matter how long it takes, but what God said is what will happen. So faith and obedience are the flip sides of the same coin. If you obey God, you obey him because you trust him. If you trust God, you will obey him. Whatever he has asked you to do, that is what you will do. So this is our faith as Christians. Our faith is not just for us to get nice cars or houses or jobs or whatever it is. But our faith is about us demonstrating that we trust God, that we believe him. And how do we do that? We do that by obeying him. So when you look at all the people that we, we read in Hebrews 11 last week from verses 1 to verse 19, we saw that they won the accolades they won, not because of any other thing, but just that they trusted in God. They were steadfast in their trust in God. And that's the same expectation that God has for us today, that we would trust him, that we would be those people who trust God, who believe that everything that is said is what is going to come to pass. So let's go ahead today and read again Hebrews chapter 11. Tonight we will start from verse 17 so that it makes a bit of sense. So we are reading Hebrews 11 from verse 17. I want you to follow with me. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham, when he was put to the test, while the testing of his faith was still in progress, had already brought Isaac for an offering. He who had gladly received and welcomed God's promises was ready to sacrifice his only son. Of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your descendants be reckoned. For he reasoned that God was able to raise him up, even from among the dead. Indeed, in the sense that Isaac was figuratively dead, potentially sacrificed, Abraham did actually receive him back from the dead. With eyes of faith, Isaac, looking far into the future, invoked blessings upon Jacob and Esau. So the Bible here is taking us back to the book of Genesis and is showing us that Father Abraham was put to test by God. When God asked him to go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice Isaac, Abraham didn't delay. He took his son. He took everything they needed for a sacrifice, saddled their donkeys, and started on that journey to Moriah. The Bible says he gladly received and had welcomed God's promise and was ready to sacrifice his only son. What was God's promise to Abraham? God's promise to Abraham was that he would have a son called Isaac and that through Isaac, through the seed of Abraham, he was going to have, through Isaac, many, many descendants, many, many children. But if that same God who gave you Isaac and told you that from this son, you're going to have many, many descendants, that same God tells you to go and sacrifice Isaac, go and kill him. And you actually obey. From a human perspective, if the only son you had in your old age, at the age of 99, the only son you had is actually getting killed. You are the one killing him. Who then is going to give birth to all these children that are going to be like the stars of the heavens? So 
logically speaking, in terms of human logic, the request from God for Isaac to be sacrificed did not really make sense. But because Abraham was not rationalizing what God was saying, he was dependent on God's promise. If God, who cannot lie, has told me that I'm going to have descendants as numerous as the stars and as numerous as the sand by the seashore, then God is going to make it happen. If he's asking me to kill Isaac, then there must be a way that he's going to resurrect Isaac again from the dead because the promise will come to pass. God cannot promise me lies. So this is what the Bible is saying here. Abraham, in his heart, had already killed Isaac. God stopped him before he actually used a knife to kill his son. He stopped him and said, now I know, now I know. Now I know, Abraham, that you love me, that you honor me, that you are faithful to me. Now I know, I've tested your faith. And now I know because you, Abraham, have treated me as that God that I am. The God who is called El Emet, the Lord God of truth. You knew that I cannot lie to you. That's why when I told you to bring Isaac for sacrifice, you brought him. The Bible is telling us here, and you can see it in the text I've highlighted in yellow, that Isaac was figuratively dead. Because from the moment Abraham left his house with Isaac for Mount Moriah, in his heart, Isaac has already been sacrificed. He was not holding back. He was withholding nothing. And because in his heart, Isaac was already dead. The Bible is saying, in a way, figuratively, he received Isaac back from the dead. This was an act of faith. What was faithful about Abraham? He believed God, that God can't lie. Whatever he's promised me, he will bring it to pass, even if I don't understand how he's going to do it. And then the Bible goes on to talk about Isaac now, who is the son of father Abraham. It says with the eyes of faith, Isaac, looking far into the future, invoked blessings upon Jacob and Esau. For Isaac, who couldn't see very well in the realm of the natural, his natural eyesight had gone very dim. He couldn't even tell apart who was Jacob and who was Esau. But by faith, he knew that he was a carrier of the blessing of Abraham. By faith, Isaac knew that when his father had prayed for him, he had passed on to him a specific blessing that would follow their, their family, a blessing that would follow their lineage. And so with the eyes of faith, before Isaac dies, he transfers that blessing onto his next son. And we know that even though he had intended to bless Esau, he had by the hand of God to bless Jacob because Jacob was the one who was going to be in the line of the Messiah, Jesus. By doing that, by transferring those blessings, even though he couldn't physically see the future, even though he wouldn't be there in the future, by the eye of the spirit and through his faith, he believed that the promise God had given to Father Abraham, that that promise had been passed on to him, and that, that promise needed to be passed on to his sons. And all that was through faith. And we know that that blessing continued to go forth. And indeed, Jacob was blessed and lived a life that agreed with the plan of God for his life. The Bible says, prompted by faith. Now, we started with Father Abraham and then goes on to Isaac, his son. And then now the son of Isaac, Jacob, himself also, by faith, when he was dying, he did not want to die with that blessing, you know, not being transferred. With those eyes of faith, he blessed each of Joseph's sons. He blessed them and released the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant upon them. And you can see this family just passing on the blessing from one to the other because they believed that when God blessed them, he meant it. And then it goes on to Joseph. When Joseph was nearing the end of his life, the Bible says he referred to the promise of God for the departure of the Israelites out of Egypt. Now we know that Father God had told Abraham that his descendants were going to go to Egypt. They were going to be then, they were going to be slaves, but they were going to come out after 400 years. 
Joseph believed that they were going to go back to the promised land. So even though he had been made the prime minister of Egypt, he had so much power that Pharaoh had bestowed on him. He had a good life. He was in prosperity. He had everything that today we would say is what people are looking for. All this success in the realm of the natural. Joseph had all that. However, in his spirit, he still knew that Egypt was not the final destination of the Israelites. He knew that the final destination was Canaan. And so before Joseph died, he made sure that he gave instructions to his brethren saying, when the day comes for the exodus, for the Israelites to leave Egypt and go to Canaan, the promised land, the land of promise, don't leave me at my bones here in Egypt. Take my bones with you and take me to Canaan, to that promised land. Joseph looked ahead. He wasn't just content with the realms of the natural, but he was concerned about the things of the spirit, what God had said. Joseph could have had the best funeral in Egypt as the prime minister. He could even have ended up in one of the, you know, the pyramids, the expensive tombs that the pharaohs used to build. But all that meant nothing to him. What was important to him was for the promise of God to come to pass. And so by faith, he believed that even though I'm dying now and my people have not left Egypt, he believed that the word of God will come to pass. And we know that truly in the days of the Exodus, in the days of Moses, they carried the bones of Joseph with them as they left Egypt. So those bones reached Canaan. And that is what Joseph had looked ahead to by faith. Now, you look at these people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They didn't die saying, oh, the promises God gave us never came. No, they died saying the promise, it will come. They believed God. Brethren, tonight, I want to ask you, do you believe God? Do you believe that it will come? Everything that God has said, do you really believe that it will come? Because it is if you believe that it will come, that you are well pleasing to God because it says in Hebrews eleven six, 6 without faith it is impossible to please God you know one Bible scholar Ray Stedman says that when you look at Abraham you look at Isaac you look at Jacob you look at um, Joseph you will see something about all of them they exercised faith in what was invisible at their time they exercised faith in what was invisible. But they were not just dreamers or wishful thinkers, but they saw the invisible reality that God has promised them. And what they did is they adapted their own lives and the lives of their descendants according to the promise. In the same way, we are supposed to do the same. When we listen to the word of God, when we read the word of God, we are supposed to see the reality of the word of God. Even if your physical eye can't see it, your spiritual eyes need to see it. And then you need to adapt your own life according to the word of God. Change your lifestyle. Change how you live according to what the word has said. When you have a firm conviction in what God has said, your life will reflect your conviction. We go forward. Hebrews 11 verses 23 to 25. Again, we're reading Amplified Classical Version. He says, prompted by faith. It was faith that prompted his parents. Prompted by faith. After his birth, Moses was kept concealed for three months by his parents because they saw how calmly the child was and they were not overawed or terrified by the king's decree. When Moses was born, a decree had been released by the Pharaoh saying that all baby boys were to be killed. His parents moved by faith. They believed that this child we've had is not going to be killed like any other child. By faith, his mother began to weave a basket. By faith, she weaved the basket and hid Moses in that basket. And they went to put the basket out at the river Nile. And that's how the daughter of Pharaoh was able to adopt Moses. Now, when you look at that story, why did they hide him? They were motivated by faith in God. They believed that God was going to save this boy, that God was going to save him. 
and that's why they took all that trouble. So remember last week we were talking about how faith without works is dead. If you say you have faith in God, what have you done to demonstrate your faith? Moses' mother, God didn't weave the basket for her. She weaved the basket herself as an act of faith. I'm going to weave this basket and I'm going to put this boy inside and I'm going to take him to the Nile River and hope that one of the Egyptian people is going to save this child. She did something. She acted. And that's how we are supposed to be as well. What basket do you need to weave? You say, oh God, help me. Oh God, deliver me. Oh God, do this. But then what is it on your side that you need to do to prepare to receive the miracle? Moses' parents didn't just sit down in the house and do nothing. They weaved the basket and they put him on the river Nile. And all that they did by faith. The Bible says they were not overawed or terrified by the king's decree. This is what the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah chapter 8. It says, call ye not conspiracy what these people call conspiracy. Neither fear ye their fear. But he says, sanctify the Lord your host. It is him that you're supposed to be afraid of. You're not supposed to be terrified by the decrees of human beings. What human beings are saying. Instead, you're supposed to stand in awe of God. That means marvel at the power of God. And honor his holiness and honor who he is. That's what Moses' parents did. They were not moved by the decree of the Pharaoh, but they focused on the God who was able to save. And God saved Moses because of the faith of the parents. The Bible says, aroused by faith, Moses, when he had grown to maturity and become great, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he preferred to share the oppression, suffer the hardships, and bear the shame of the people of God rather than to have the fleeting enjoyment of a sinful life. Picture this, brethren. Let's say you have been adopted by somebody at Buckingham Palace today in the United Kingdom. You have suddenly been adopted by the Queen of England, the Queen of the United Kingdom. And you have grown up in the palace being called the child of the Queen. And then all of a sudden, when you're grown up, you say, no, I'm not a member of the royal family. I belong to a different family. I belong to the family of God. And by saying that, it means you forfeit the comfort of the palace. You forfeit the money that you had access to. You forfeit the respect, the honor, the servants, people waiting upon you, the prestige of having been a member of the royal family. You forfeit all that to go and live with the people who are homeless, who don't even have a house, never mind a palace. That's what Moses did. Moses had been brought up as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In those days, Egypt was not how it is today. Egypt was a superpower. It was the center of civilization. It was a superpower. It was bigger than how we perceive America today. Egypt wasn't just a small nation. For Moses to have been treated as the, the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter meant that Moses had a high ranking in the Egyptian royal family. That meant that he had a place, a position of privilege, a position of being in a prestigious institution where he had all these servants, all the wealth of Egypt, everything was available for Moses. But the Bible says, by faith, when he became mature, when he began to understand who Yahweh is and what the life of the Israelites is all about, he renounced all allegiance to the Egyptian royal family. The Bible says he preferred to share the oppression, to suffer the hardship of being an Israelite. He preferred the shame of the people of God who were slaves. Being a slave was a shameful thing. He preferred to share their shame than to have the fleeting enjoyment of a sinful life. Why does the Bible call it the fleeting enjoyment? Because no matter how long you live on planet Earth, let's say you lived to be 99 years old or 100 years old. That 100 years old cannot be compared to eternity. Because eternity, we will lose count of the number of years. 
And so Moses made a decision based on securing his eternity. He looked at his temporary life on planet Earth and he said, I would rather suffer on the right side than enjoy a brief life in a sinful place, enjoying something that is not going to last. And that's a decision that many Christians in modern day society need to make. Do you want to enjoy the temporary pleasure of a sinful lifestyle and then suffer in eternity? Or do you want to suffer a little bit now, be unpopular a little bit now, you know, forego some of the comforts and the pleasures of doing what you like when you want to do it and submit yourself to God so that your eternity is secured. Moses made the right decision. I pray for us all tonight that we will make that right decision as well in Jesus name. Let's go on to verses 26 to 28. The Bible says, Moses considered the contempt and abuse and shame born for the Christ, the Messiah who was to come, to be greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt. For he looked forward and away to the reward, the recompense. Moses wasn't looking at how much money there was in Egypt. He was motivated by the future of eternity. He was looking at the reward that God would give him. Because all of us, I'm sure, on judgment day, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You don't want to hear something like, I never knew you. I don't know you. You are not part of my family. Go into hell, into everlasting darkness. None of us want that. The Bible says, motivated by faith, Moses left Egypt behind, being unawed and undismayed by the wrath of the king. For he never flinched, but held staunchly to his purpose and endured steadfastly as one who gazed on him who is invisible. Moses, if he had started looking back to his past life, could have had the opportunity to go back. But the Bible says he held on. He didn't flinch. He was staunch in purpose. And he kept looking at him who is invisible. That's the only way for us to continue with this Christian race is focusing our eyes on Jesus all the time. He's invisible to the human eye, but he's visible in the spirit. When we focus our eyes on him, we can keep going. We can keep moving on. He says, Moses, by faith, simple trust and confidence in God, he instituted and carried out the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood on the doorpost so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch those of the children of Israel. So we know that the Passover was instituted by faith. Moses didn't know for a fact that if you didn't put blood on, your, on the doorpost of your house, your, your, your firstborn is going to die. But because God had told him, he believed it and he did it. And thank God he obeyed him and all the Israelite people obeyed and God saved their lives. So all the instructions God is um, giving us, even though you can't understand why that instruction is there, do it because there is a purpose to it. At the end of the day, it will end up for our own good. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven twenty nine, 29, urged on by faith, the Israelites crossed the Red Sea as if they were walking on dry land, as if it wasn't a sea. They crossed the Red Sea by faith. But when the Egyptians tried to do the same thing, they were swallowed up by the sea. Why? Because it was the faith in the word of God that made that Red Sea to roll back and create dry land for these people to walk through. The Egyptians didn't have the same faith that Moses had had and that this group of people had. And because they didn't have faith, when they tried to walk in the middle of the Red Sea, the water would not allow them, it overflowed them. This is to tell us that when we see people who are walking by faith, you cannot follow their footsteps by your self-will or by your strength or by your power. Sometimes we will look at people who have faith. We will see them doing things by faith doing exploits by faith. And then you suddenly think, okay, she did it. It doesn't look hard. I can do it. But if you do it with your own strength, with your own mind, with your own ideas, it won't work for you. That's why some people will say, oh, well, the Bible doesn't work. It's not true. Um, how come so-and-so received divine healing and I didn't? But that's not how it works. It's about how the faith of God has prompted you to 
obey his word and then God will do the miracle. You can't make God do a miracle. It's only your faith that will empower the intervention of God. When the Egyptians tried to walk in the Red Sea because they were not doing it by faith and they were not part of the promise, the sea swallowed them up. Let's go forward to verse 30. The Bible says, because of faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encompassed for seven days by the Israelites because of faith. God had given Joshua the instructions for how to take Jericho. Those instructions sounded like they were ridiculous. It sounded like it can't happen. Who wins a battle like that? The instruction is walk around the whole of Jericho once for seven days. And then on the seventh day, walk around seven times quietly. Don't talk. Don't make any noise. On the seventh day, when you walk for the seventh time, blow the trumpets. Let the priest blow the trumpets. People blow horns and shout. That's all. That was the instruction. And you know what? When they did that, that wall that had been, you know, built with great skill and good engineering principles, that wall crumbled because they acted by faith. It was by faith the walls fell down. If they had decided to change the instruction, it wouldn't have worked. And for many of us today, that's how we are. When God gives us an instruction, we amend it. We say, okay, God, um, you said I should wake up every day at 3 a.m. and pray. But Lord, it's winter in the UK and 3 a.m. is when my sleep is deepest. I'm going to amend it. Instead of praying at 3, Lord, I'm going to be praying at 10 o'clock every day. 10 o'clock, that's when I will pray. But the instruction was 3 a.m. We cannot amend God's instructions and hope to have the same victory. If you want the victory, obey to the letter and God will help us. The Bible says, prompted by faith, Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed along with those who refused to believe and obey because she had received the spies in peace without enmity. Now, Rahab was the woman who lived by the walls of Jericho. And Rahab had seen that the God these Israelites are serving is an incredible God. He's amazing. And she had decided to put her faith in the God of the Israelites. She heard how they had crossed the Red Sea. She heard what had happened to the Egyptians and she decided that she wanted to be on the side of this God. By faith, she refused to give up the spies whom the people of Jericho were looking for, the, the Israelite spies that had been sent. She trusted God and you know what? God delivered her because that's all it takes to receive help from God. It's faith in God. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't even matter your profession. Rahab was a prostitute by profession. But God saved her because of her faith in God. And I'm sure that was the last time she practiced that trade. Because we find her in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means she gave it all up and must have married a decent man of God. Amen. Verses 32 to 34. The Bible says, after all these examples that the Bible has been giving us from the, the beginning of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 3. We've seen so many heroes of faith. The Bible says, and what shall I say further? What more can I say? What other example do you need to know? You've seen all these people who live by faith. He says, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Look at how Gideon had no confidence, had no courage, but God used him to destroy the Midianite army. He says, time would fail me to tell of Gideon who acted by faith and won the battle over the Midianites. What about Barak? These are all the judges, heroes. What about Samson? Whose strength had so much tormented the Philistines? Jephthah. What about David? We know all the battles that David won. What about Samuel? Whose word? Every word he spoke in the name of God. The Bible says none of his words fell to the ground. Every word he spoke came to pass. Samuel and all the prophets. You see all the scripture references there. There are so many things these heroes of faith did. The Bible says, by the help of faith, they subdued kingdoms. They administered justice. They obtained promised blessings. They closed the mouths of lions. They extinguished the power of raging fire. They escaped the devourings of the sword. Out of frailty and weakness, they won strength and became stalwart, even mighty and resistless in battle, routing alien armies. These people achieved a lot, but all they achieved, they achieved by faith. 
if you also want to do exploits for God, if you also want to go down in the archives of history, then exercise your faith. These people, there is nothing special about them other than the fact that they exercise faith. If you exercise faith, you can experience some of the astounding things that these people experience. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 35, some women received again their dead children. Remember the widow in the days of, of Elijah. Remember the Shunammite woman. Remember all these women, their children died. But by faith in the word of God through the mouth of, of God's prophets, their children came back to life. They, they got all these amazing breakthroughs by faith. So we can see up to this point, that faith can help you get the biggest breakthroughs, experience the greatest things that Christianity can offer you. And then now, the tone of the chapter changes. It says others were tortured to death with clubs, refusing to accept release, offered on the terms of their denying their faith, so that they might be resurrected to a better life. Others had to suffer the trial of mocking, scourging, and even chains and imprisonment. These people suffered. The Bible says some were tortured to death with clubs. And when you read Bible history, it tells us that this phrase of being tortured to death with clubs was an excruciating death whereby they, you know, the drums that people play in Africa or the bongo drums, those type of drums. So what they would do is they would take a drum instead of using skin to cover the drum. They would use a human being. They would stretch the human being over the drum, tie them down, hands here, legs there. And then they would beat the person. They would beat them up with clubs until they died. You know, historians tell us that this was a very painful way to die. And yet there were some believers in Christ Jesus who preferred to be tortured in this way. In the days, you know, of all those heathen kings, of, of the, the Roman emperors, many people were killed in this manner who believed in Christ Jesus. But they refused to deny their faith. They were told, deny Jesus or die. And they refused and they beat them to death. These people, they were heroes of faith because what allowed them to let these people kill them was because they were not looking at the temporary life. They were thinking about eternity. I would rather die in pain here and live a free life for eternity rather than deny Christ and then suffer for eternity. The Bible says these people allowed themselves to suffer so that they might be resurrected to a better life. Whatever they went through, when we read the, the history of all the disciples of Jesus, none of them died an easy death. All of them went through some form of torture. We heard that Apostle Peter was crucified on the cross, but because he didn't want to die like Jesus, they put the cross upside down, which was even more painful way to die. Upside down, all the blood flowing the wrong way, you know, and that's how he died. There were some who they tie one hand to a horse on this side, another hand to another horse on this side, hand and leg this side, and then they hit the horses so that the horses will start running in different directions. And that person will be torn into two, violently dismembered. But they prefer to die in that way than to deny Jesus. The Bible says others had to suffer the trial of mocking and scourging. They, they, they suffered imprisonment. There were some, we know even up to today, in Iran, in countries like Iran, like Syria, places like that, there are some Christians who are in prison even right now imprisoned for their faith they'll say deny jesus and they'll say no and you go to prison say some were stoned to death some were lured with tempting offers i'll give you money if you renounce your faith i'll give you a job if you renounce your faith i'll promote you if you renounce your faith but they refused they were sown asunder literally torn asunder they were slaughtered by the sword some had to be wrapped in skins of sheep and goats. They were utterly destitute. They didn't have money in the bank, money anywhere. They were destitute, no food, no money, no home, nothing. Oppressed and cruelly treated. The Bible says the world was not worthy of these people. They roamed over desolate places and mountains, living in caves, caverns and holes of the earth. And all these, though they won divine approval by means of their faith, did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised because God had us in mind and had something better and greater in view for us so that they 
should not come to perfection apart from us. What does this mean? It means that these people, as much as they suffered, they literally died without actually seeing the fulfillment of the promise, but they were not bothered. They died saying the promise will come, the promise will come. And what was that big promise they were waiting for? It was the manifestation of the Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ. God had us in mind. When these people were suffering in the past, he didn't allow Jesus to come then. He allowed him to come the time he came, 2020 years ago, died for us then. You know, he allowed it to happen then because he had us in mind. By the time Jesus was crucified on that cross, God had us in mind as well. All of us together are now beneficiaries of what Jesus did, the finished work of the cross. We and these people who suffered so much. And so today when God is asking you to surrender some of the little bits of comfort he's asked you to surrender, wake up in the morning and pray. Wake up and study the Bible. I hope you will not think it's too hard. I hope you will not give excuses because you can see what big a price other people had to pay for their faith. At least none of you has yet been imprisoned for Christianity. Nobody has put you in prison for reading the Bible. Nobody has arrested you for praying. You can still pray freely. You can still study the Bible freely. So why not go ahead and do it? Why give God 10,000 excuses when you've actually not suffered as much as what some people in the past have suffered? As we round up tonight, I want us to remember one thing. God's will shall be done. What God has promised, that's what's going to happen. And what God desires, that's what's going to happen. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord, it will stand. Whatever God's counsel is, it's going to stand. You can plan what you like, but God's counsel is going to stand. And he says, God nullifies the counsel of the nations. So if the nations are bringing out plans that are not ag in agreement with the word of God, God will nullify that counsel and frustrate the plans of human beings because he has a plan. There is a bigger picture that we must submit to. In Isaiah 46 verses 9 to 10, the Bible says, remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things which have not been done saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. What is this scripture saying? It's saying this, that God, God has a will. And that will will not be frustrated because God declares the end from the beginning. So for your life, child of God, before you were even born, God says, I knew you. I knew you. I ordained you. I already chose for you what you're going to be before you were even formed in your mother's womb. When God looks at you today, he doesn't see you in your raw state. He sees the finished product. He seems he sees what you ought to be even if you're not yet there. He declares the end from the beginning. So God doesn't start from zero and go to 100. He starts from 100 and comes back down because he declares the end from the beginning. Ancient things that he, he already decided that have not been done, but they are going to come to pass because he decided it. He said, my purpose will be established and I'll accomplish all my good pleasure. If we have faith in his word, we are not going to live beneath the standard God called us to live. If we have faith in his word, his good purpose for us is going to come to pass. So in summary, as we close Hebrews chapter 11, you can see that faith is not just a matter of mentally agreeing to what the word is saying. So it's not just about giving mental assent. Yes, I agree. Yes, I believe. But deep down inside, you are not convinced. Your life is not reflecting your faith. Faith is where I completely believe what God has said and I live my life accordingly. I stake my entire life on God's promise. I say, if God said it, I'm going to die for it. You live your life in a way that demonstrates you believe that what God has said is true. So God said, I do this, I'm going to do it. God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself. I'm going to not forsake the assembling of ourselves. God says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I'm going to love my neighbor as much as I love myself. Even if my neighbor doesn't like me, even if my neighbor is racist, even if my neighbor is hateful, even if my neighbor is quarrelsome, I'm going to love them like I love myself because God said it. I'm going to live my life in that way. My life is going to demonstrate what I believe. 
I'm not going to just say, oh, yes, oh, yes, I agree. Oh, it's lovely. First Corinthians 13 is all about love and it's wonderful and I agree. But then I go around hating everybody. That's not how a Christian lives. Living in faith, brethren, is going to require us to make sacrifices. We're going to face challenges. If you are truly living a life of faith, you're going to have challenges and you're going to have to make sacrifices. There isn't any Christian who lives their life without facing challenges or making sacrifices. There are some things you're going to have to give up. Other people might spend 20 hours a day watching Netflix. You might have to sacrifice and say, look, I don't care how interesting Netflix is. I'm going to sacrifice it because I need to do Bible study. Some people might say, oh, you know what? I'm not going to wait until I get married. I'm going to have sex with whoever I want to have sex with. And if I'm married, I don't care about being faithful. I'm going to have sex with whom I want to have sex with. That's not living a Christ-like life. A Christian lives their life according to the word of God. And you're going to have make, to make sacrifices. There'll be a time when you need to tell your flesh to be quiet so that you can obey God. Hebrews 11 was not just written to praise the Old Testament spiritual giants. Remember, when we were starting even this study of the book of Hebrews, I told us that this book was aimed at those Hebrews who had given their lives to Christ. But persecution had started. People were giving them a hard time. There was a temptation to give up and go back to the past. So this chapter is written to show us that there is no good reason for you to shrink back from serving Christ. But you need to persevere and continue to receive what God has promised you. If other people believed God even when they were being killed, at least you are not being asked to die. What you're being asked to do is not that dramatic. So don't give up. Don't go back to the past. Don't go back to your old life. Faith is about being ready to sacrifice the present comfort for future reward with Christ. It could be comfortable for me not to serve God. Be comfortable. There are many other things to do in an evening rather than teach Bible study. It could be comfortable not to finish work and quickly run to church service. Yes, I could do many. I could be sleeping. I could go and have a spa. I could be filing my nails. There are many things you could do. But faith is about sacrificing your present comfort to make sure that your future reward is secured in Christ Jesus. I can't just live my life anyhow. If I'm saying I'm a child of God and I walk by faith, there are some things I'm going to have to sacrifice. Faith helps you to focus on God, not on people or things. So when you're living a life of faith, it doesn't really matter what other people are doing. You're not moved. You don't say, oh, I'm going to stop praying because all these Christians are hypocrites. I'm not going to go to church because all these Christians are hypocrites. No, your faith is about focusing on God, not on human beings or things. Because things are going to end. There's nothing on planet Earth right now that is not going to end. In fact, the Bible says we're looking forward to a new Earth and a new heaven. That means the Earth as we see it right now is going to be completely regenerated. So if you're more focused on things, oh, I'm worried about the house I built. I'm worried about the business. In another 200 years time, there might be no trace left of that house that you're so worried about. You know, the things of this earth are not going to last. Faith is about focusing on eternity and on God. Faith trusts and obeys, leaving the results to God. So you're not going to say, oh, I tried to obey last year. It didn't take me very far. So now this year, I'm doing it my way. I'm going to do it my way. I'll sort it out myself. No. When you have faith, you trust God, you obey God, and you leave the results to whatever God decided. If God decides to help you now, that's good. If he decides no, that's good still. If God decides that you need to go through what you're going through a bit more, then it's still good because it's what you, you've, you've surrendered to the will of God. Amen. In conclusion, we need each of us to take a careful inventory of our lives today. So that we can look and think, what is it in my life that I need to reorganize? How do I need to reorder my priorities? Because I cannot live my life focused on what I'm seeing, focused on natural things. Because like I said, what you see on planet Earth today, in another 100 years, 200 years time, it may have disappeared. But you need to organize your life, prioritize according to eternity, according to eternity. So what do I mean prioritize according to eternity? Ask yourself, in your life right now, you look at the 24 hours a day God has given you. How much of your time do you dedicate to eternity? How much of your time is dedicated to your relationship with God, prayer, Bible study? 
How much of your time is dedicated to just what is on the physical realm? If your life is more about physical realm and not eternity, then you can be sure that you're missing out because you're focusing on what is going to be destroyed. But what is in eternity can never be destroyed. So if I'm focusing my life, reordering my priorities according to the word of God, then I'm not going to lose out. And then as I reorganize my life, I can't do it out of legalism. It can't be a case of, oh, well, they keep going on at us in church about join Bible study. Oh, join Bible study. Oh, join prayer. So I'm going to just join the Bible study. In fact, I will just uh, uh, log on to Zoom and then I can carry on with my other things. If Auntie Patience wants to be talking, let her be talking and at least Pastor Kingsley will stop reminding us every Sunday. That's legalism. It's useless. If you're not going to be invested in it, you might as well leave it. You know, what we are doing for God, let's do it because we love God. Not because we want to please a human being. Not because we want any human being to notice. Even if the human beings don't notice, I go ahead and do what I do for God out of love for God. That's how we need to reorder our lives. God has promised us it shall be so. The earthly life, the Bible says, is, is like a vapor. It's not much. You can't invest all your energy on something that's going to disappear one day. Don't waste your life. Focus on eternity. And this comes down to daily, moment by moment choices. When I wake up in the morning, what time do I choose to wake up? What time do I choose to pray? What time do I choose to spend time with God? What time do I choose to do the things God wants me to do? God wants me to be an evangelist. Is there anyone I've evangelized? God wants me to be a teacher. Have I taught anybody anything for God? God wants me to be a pastor. What am I doing to prepare for this assignment? God wants you to be an apostle to the nations. What are you doing right now to prepare yourself? So day by day, every decision I make, I'm either serving God or I'm serving the God of this present evil age. Am I serving God or am I serving mammon? Am I serving money? Is it all about money? Who am I serving? So these are the questions we ought to ask ourselves. And my prayer tonight, brethren, is that we would take everything God has given us by faith and focus on eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to stop here tonight. If anyone has any contributions or additions. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for an opportunity once again to read your Bible. Father, I receive, oh God, from your word, the courage and the strength to live a life of faith. Faith in your finished work, O oh God. Faith in the finished work of the cross. Faith in the revealed word and in the rima word that you have given to us. I ask, dear God, that everyone who listens to this teaching, that may their lives be transformed and may they live a life that demonstrates the faith that we all claim to have. May your name alone be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.